You are now tuned in to the Hip Hop Learners Podcast, a place for conversations on hip hop literature, both scholarly as well as academic. Last episode, I announced that the podcast is now available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Alexa devices, as well as, of course, our hosting site, Podbean. If you haven't done so already, please give the podcast a like, as it really helps the algorithms going forward. Today's guest is Dr. Margaret Robinson. Uh, Robinson, after completing her PhD at the University of Toronto, now teaches at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Her work centers around social justice and issues relating to gender, indigeneity, queer theory, among others. Recently, Robinson contributed to the edited collection We Still Hear, Hip Hop North of the 49th Parallel, with an article called Last Night a DJ Saved My Life, Hip Hop, Cultural Continuity, and First Nations Suicidality. I really enjoyed the article as it speaks on themes of identity, hip-hop accessibility, as well as mental health. I strongly suggest giving the article in the corresponding collection a read, but first, here's my conversation with Margaret Robinson. Enjoy. I guess to, to start the, the podcast, I know I said this at the beginning of the call here, but I can't thank you enough for taking the time out to speak to me here today. I appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh, thanks for having me, Alex. Yeah, of course. Um, I, um, I, I, got in, I guess I got introduced to you through, through this work. So you ended up publishing an, an article, um, in the, the edited collection. We still hear hip hop north of the 49th parallel. It was edited by Charity Marsh and Mark Campbell. And I've spoken to both of them previously on the podcast. And as someone that kind of works and researches Canadian hip hop, it was, really a, a blessing to be able to to get my hands on a collection like this and to be able to dive into some of this material. And the paper that you ended up submitting for it was was easily one of my favorites kind of within the within the collection. I just wanted to start by asking how you ended up getting introduced to this subject material and I guess hip hop studies specifically. Uh, I guess I started off as a hip hop fan and when you're an academic you look for opportunities to talk to other people about stuff you enjoy and there didn't seem to be a lot of places to talk about hip-hop and then I saw the call for the book uh people the the editors were looking for book chapters and I thought "Ooh, that sounds interesting um and the more I thought about it the more different ideas of material I'd already read started to come together to form sort of a potential argument um so it, it all happened pretty quickly you're at Dalhousie now. Did you grow up in Halifax? I um, I grew up outside of Halifax. So I grew up in a rural area about, well, when I grew up there, it was a two-hour drive to Halifax. Uh, I grew up in Sheet Harbor, Nova Scotia. Uh, and then it I went to Halifax for my undergrad. So I went to St. Mary's University. So I was living in Halifax while I did that. And then I went to Toronto for my master's and my PhD. So I lived there for about 20 years and then found a job that let me move back home. So uh, <laughs> I've mostly lived in Halifax, Toronto, and the middle of the woods in Nova Scotia. Fair enough. Yeah, I think the, uh, again, as someone that's that's researching Canadian hip-hop, um, the, the scene in Halifax often ends up getting overlooked by people that are not really kind of, I guess, tuned in. Um, but the, the Halifax hip-hop community has been so vibrant and enthusiastic over the years like the just so rich culturally um let it be buck 65 and hip club groove or um joe run in the the 90s to, to everything that ends up going on kind of post 2000s with backburner and alpha flight and all these kind of movements and large collectives um really end up breathing a large amount of life into this community um i think halifax is a great place to kind of find your your hip hop roots yeah, they. when I was a younger person, they had a pretty good uh, music record selection as well. So it it didn't it wasn't too difficult to find stuff I wanted to listen to. Yeah, no doubt. Um, there's uh, OK. So for the core of this paper, it kind of centers around this idea of, of cultural continuity. Um, for those listening at home, are you able to explain what this term means in a little bit more detail? Sure. It's an idea that I first encountered in work by uh, some academics called Chandler, Hallett, and Lalonde. They had done work looking at uh, suicide rates in First Nations in British Columbia. And what they noticed was some communities had skyrocketed suicide rates and some had no suicide at all. And this difference got mixed when you missed, sorry, when you lumped all the communities together and just created one suicide rate for all 
uh, BC Indigenous nations. And so the, uh, the situation was that some nations, when they looked into it, um, those who had the most control over their own lives, essentially, as Indigenous people, the ones who had um, something that looked more like their own traditional governments, that had their own uh, cultural facilities, like a place to play hockey or a place to have a ceremony, um, communities that had control over their own education system or their own fire department, uh, all these little elements that they identified, each one of these dropped the suicide rate. And in fact, when you got eight of them working together, the suicide rate disappeared entirely. Uh, so it, it, in, I found it intriguing, and I immediately started wondering if it was applicable to other situations. How, how far could we stretch it? So their idea of cultural continuity is this ability to participate in your indigenous culture and to see yourself as part of a chain of connection with your ancestors and your descendants. That's sort of seven generations in both directions that we sometimes talk about in community. I really love that idea. And thinking about it in my own life, I could immediately see how some elements of my life put me in continuity with, the, for me, it's the Mi'kmaq uh, community. And then other elements of my life were there was a disjuncture there where I wasn't feeling connected. Um, and so their idea was that for individuals for whom a personal continuity, like say you're, you're having a crisis, you're not really able to imagine your own future anymore or a future yeah. where you're going to be happy and alive. Uh, their theory was that being able to see your culture continuing could kind of act like a temporary uh, support carrying you through these tough times until you could find your feet again and see your personal continuity kick back in. And thinking about it as a queer person, I thought, oh, I wonder if this works for queer culture as well, because uh, in addition to high rates in uh, indigenous communities around suicidality. We also see high rates in queer communities. And so I was curious about like how many circumstances could this idea of the cultural continuity be applied? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's this almost sense of belonging. Um, and not only do you touch on this aspect of, of seeing that your culture is going to somehow affect your, your future, um, but also that you, you the reinforcement that it's that's already affected your past as well and that acknowledgement um that it's affecting your 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 present it's going to affect your future and it's already affected your past um in some way i think is a is a really powerful way of thinking about it i i hadn't read the the previous articles that you had mentioned there but um this was really my first time being introduced to this concept of cultural continuity and i found it a really powerful one especially kind of linking it to this notion of mental health well, it really matched up with my own experience. Like as a young person, I'd have all kinds of moments where I was like, who the hell am I? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Sure. Um, yeah. And it was often the sense of where I felt like I belonged or where I felt like I could belong that would sometimes get me through those difficult times. Uh, I remember as a when I first came out and started connecting with people as a bisexual person, um, I didn't have the self-confidence to defend myself against biphobia. But once I connected to bi community, I suddenly got the confidence to defend my friends. And so that made a huge difference for me. Yeah, the I guess the main theme um, that you kind of cover within the, the context of the article is the, the indigenous communities and how the, the history of assimilation practices have kind of particularly affected these communities and because of it they've kind of lost their their sense of cultural continuity in the process um as a, oh, yeah. as, a as a remedy to that you end up introducing hip-hop um as kind of this yeah this remedy for this lack or this losing of, of cultural continuity there are clearly many ways to to reintroduce a sense of culture to someone's life but what made hip-hop kind of stand out as as a unique way of addressing this problem uh, well, one thing was that it seemed to be working. So, uh, I mean, the federal government in Canada and the U.S. had poured many <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of uh, <laughs> dollars of uh, na national resources. I mean, the federal government has been putting resources into eliminating indigenous culture for like 100 years. So lots of indigenous communities can't access the culture that they should have inherited from their 
um, their parents and their grandparents. And so that problem, um, people have been trying to solve that in all kinds of ways for hundreds, <laughs> really since it started happening. Um, so I think the the fact that indigenous people have been embracing hip hop and that for people who can't access their particular indigenous nation's culture, or who maybe know they're indigenous but don't know what that history is, they don't know what nation they come from, or maybe they come from a smattering of all different nations and their ancestry. Um, for those folks, I, I think hip hop can kind of be that temporary uh, community that can help you figure out where you might fit as an indigenous person, because it's, it's extremely welcoming in many ways. Um, it's accessible. There's not a big government agency gatekeeping it and deciding who can officially be considered a hip hop fan and who can't. Um, it's it's generally not that difficult to find a spot where someone might fit. Um, you know, they've, there's so many different types of hip hop, uh, and it's all over the world. And so it it seemed like it stood out to me because it was working, and it stood out to me partly because it had worked for me. When I was a young person, first going to university, I encountered the music of Public Enemy, and it helped me make sense of a lot of the things that I was angry about. Yeah, the accessibility factor is is a pretty large one. Um, you, you dedicate a section in the chapter to this idea of accessibility and how hip hop is an accessible art form, and that's something that I'm always kind of drawn to as well. Um, the this idea that even like if you compare it to other kind of uh, kinds of I guess art forms or or expressions, um, take like singing for example. Most people have a clear idea where they kind of fall on the ability to sing, right? Like I, I know myself, I can't <laughs> sing, right? Um, I'm not even going to try yeah. to sing because I, I know it's not something within my purview of possibilities, right? Maybe I could end up going to school. Maybe I could take, um, or not school per se, but maybe I could take like singing lessons and that kind of thing and, and try to end up expanding my vocal range or what have you. Um, but it's still something that's just very inaccessible. When it comes to playing guitar, for example, I know I cannot do that. Um, I could learn and I could follow those steps in order to learn but it still seems like something that's kind of inaccessible with hip-hop i think most people have this notion that it's something kind of easy now until they do it i think they start to realize that's probably not the case but there's this notion that it's it, it, you're just talking right so and you should be able to write down rhymes and you should be able to make Kind of express your thoughts in this way and then you should be able to speak them and and rap in a in a sense right again the, i think the the quality of of artists in that spectrum kind of speaks to the fact that it's probably not as easy as it as it seems but at the very least i think it, the accessibility and that that um that idea allows a lot of people to be introduced to the culture as artists uh, where they may otherwise not have been. And then the other thing is just in terms of costs and equipment. Um, it, so many other art forms, let it be if you're playing the drums, you have to buy a drum set. If you're playing um, guitar, you have to buy a guitar. Like these things have costs associated. And when you're dealing with kind of impoverished communities, um, a lot of times these costs are significant enough in order to be real kind of roadblocks in, in gaining access to that culture, that community. Um, Hip hop allows for for that not really to be the case, right? So rapping is essentially free. Um, it should be. Um, now, you may end up buying a microphone and whatnot to record material, but nevertheless, you can still end up um, joining into freestyle ciphers and that kind of thing at no cost to yourself. Um, and even kind of... A, a lot of the recording kind of technologies that have developed over the years have been very accessible, right? They uh, they make pause tapes out of a, a cassette they have and just kind of loop the last three seconds or four seconds of an instrumental over and over again into a tape recorder and then make an instrumental out of that and then buy like a, a little microphone tape recorder and, and rap into it, right? Um, these things are, are very low cost and there's always been this movement to try to make hip hop as accessible as possible. And that's really where a lot of this kind of early DIY culture starts forming in a lot of these communities. Um, I find the, the accessibility kind of portion of this article to be, to be fascinating and very true, um, especially as I'm, again, doing my research and kind of looking into these communities. I see that they're 
um, very much founded on the the DIY kind of sensibilities. Well, you had to. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, black American communities didn't have any access to the kind of resources that you might see at like a, <laughs> if a big school of music somewhere. Uh, there, you know, they were intentionally impoverished for, for decades. So there's no... There's a there's no affordable level of music participation that quite competes with with hip hop, uh, and there's all kinds of ways for indigenous folks who are similarly economically oppressed uh, to participate in ways that kind of mirror, echo, and kind of jump off of some of the traditional stuff we already do. Like there's a long spoken word poetry tradition in the East Coast Mi'kmaq, and the uh, that could easily segue into rap. Um, and you can do language reclamation work with it. Uh, I think about the comparisons between Inuit throat singing and beatboxing or uh, breakdancing and traditional and contemporary powwow dance. Like, there's all kinds of ways that people could find an entry point to hip hop and to do it without breaking the bank. Yeah, and I think hip hop and I guess rap specifically has this has this ability to to allow it to be very personable and because of that also allow for almost any sort of experience to impact their ability to make art so um this is the, probably the case for things like poetry in general um let it be just written poetry or something like rap or um i don't know there's probably other art forms as well that kind of fall into this category but i but i do see it very strong in hip-hop and that's um for example, if I were to if I were to read a, a comic series, say I read The Watchmen, um, and I really get immersed in that, and I, I learn about The Watchmen, I can now use that um, that experience and that knowledge and that vocabulary um, to benefit my my rap, right? Um, I could I can make subtle references to it. I could um, there's there's so much that you could do. You could sample things. Um, it's so it's so welcoming to kind of bringing in your totality of your experiences and displaying it within your art form, that it really ends up being this really kind of personal endeavor with art, um, where I, I don't see that the case in a lot of other in a lot of other art forms. Um, again, I don't think it's exclusive to hip hop. Um, and definitely it would be the case within like poetry, for example. Um, there's, I would say hip hop is poetry, but I guess more traditional poetry. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's a, it's a really personal art form because of that. And you see that expressed in the creativity. Uh, I've watched a documentary about a sort of global hip hop and you recognize it as hip hop, no matter where it's coming from. It, there are elements that definitely resonate with, with the genre, but uh, people do it all differently depending on where they're from and what their experience is. So the, yeah. the leeway you have within the musical genre for self-expression and for uh, trying new things, uh, it, it's really impressive. There's a, there's a quote on page 193 of the hardcover edition of the collection, which states, um, quote, by reframing our traditions as the materials of contemporary indigenous art, hip hop frees us from the rigidity of fundamentalist approaches to culture that equate authenticity with lack of change, unquote. And um, I, I think this is one of the most kind of interesting ideas in the piece to me, this idea that there is almost a stubbornness involved, a resistance to change in order to be um i guess authentic with your culture and hip-hop somehow allows one to negate this and be authentic while incorporating new youth movements to new ideas more broadly um how important do you see this notion of change in in one's ability to identify with their own culture and express their culture specifically youth and, and young adults it's essential so when i was a undergrad student i took latin and they were very specific that Latin is a dead language in that, you know, people aren't born as first language Latin speakers anymore. Sure. Um, and it, it really stuck with me that if things don't change and get embraced, they die. And as a member of a community that is uh, sometimes framed as if we're all dying out, when in fact our population is growing, um, you're always sort of struggling with this idea that 
um, were presented as these tragically doomed people. And that doesn't resonate with how our lives feel to us. And the, uh, the tendency, particularly by settlers' uh, courts, to see indigenous authenticity as just recreating what we did in the past. I mean, courts have denied land claims because indigenous people ate pizza and drove cars. And they said, well, you're not the same indigenous people who lived on this land before then. You're just yeah. some someone with an, uh, you're an assimilated person or you're just someone with indigenous ancestry. Um, as if being a contemporary person somehow is antithetical to being indigenous. Uh, that nailing us into the past thing, uh, that, is, that is an entirely colonial way of looking at indigeneity. Uh, actor Adam Beach said they like us in the 1800s, talking about the difficulty getting contemporary roles for indigenous people. Uh, it's all beads and feathers. And that really reflected my experience of how people presented our culture. Um, so I, I found it very freeing to to be able to see contemporary indigeneity represented when indigenous people did hip hop, uh, especially urban life and my own experiences. And to listen to new experiences that were about a contemporary existence, but in some other place that I haven't been and I think if you can't talk about your contemporary life, you don't have that cultural continuity. You may as well be cosplaying somewhere. Yeah, you mentioned the, I guess, the colonial perspective or their um, kind of presence in this debate anyhow. But do you see that this notion is still prevalent within Indigenous cultures as well? Do you see, say, the older population within Indigenous communities still kind of staying true to these traditional values and, and unwilling to kind of accept new forms of expression or um, maybe, uh, yeah, new ways of uh, expressing or communicating those same cultural beliefs? I find it varies uh, drastically. So... Uh... I mean, in my own nation, the elders tend to uh, be pretty in touch with younger people. Okay. And so they're, they're usually like the cool grandmas and the cool grandpas. Um, where Fair I enough. do sometimes see uh, hesitance about, uh, and maybe a, an emphasis on, well, that's not the way we used to do it kind of approach um, in, in that middle group where maybe... Maybe they went to residential school and they're reconnecting with their culture and they want to make sure that what they got as cultural teachings is the real thing. They don't want some fake teaching dressed up in indigenous costume. They want realness. And so I think a lot of people have a hunger, especially if they've had their culture stolen from them by the government, they have a hunger to get it back and they want to make sure that what they get is, is legitimate. And so there is an emphasis on making sure that the people who claim indigenous identity are actually indigenous and that the people who are presenting indigenous teachings can identify where those teachings came from and who taught them and like establish a chain of connection. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that we then have to quash anything that's new. Um, I think, I think there's lots of ways to, to have continuity with what came before, but to also recognize that new things are sometimes going to look different. Yeah, one of the one of the conversations that I had with Charity Marsh, and I feel like a fair amount of other kind of scholars have touched on this as well, but that's almost this translation factor that, that hip hop has. Um, when you go from community to community, you were mentioning looking at that global hip hop documentary and seeing how their culture is expressed differently out there, um, or put into an indigenous context and see how hip hop is expressed um, uniquely in, in that context than it is elsewhere. There's almost this, this translation of hip hop culture from place to place to place, and you end up seeing it kind of translated into these different forms or, or different meanings. Um, I, I find that whole idea fascinating to be able to explore these different kinds of translations uh, within hip hop, because um, oftentimes I feel like they're not 
they're not necessarily appreciated as as authentically hip hop in many ways, right? You have your you have your kind of few different buckets that exist, and it's usually within the purview of American hip hop. So you have your East Coast kind of New York style. Um, you have what's going on in like the gangster rap era in, in the the late '80s, early '90s out of LA. Um, you have even what's going down like uh, in Atlanta with like Outkast and whatnot, and a lot of the current kind of movements that are going on down south. Um, these are are viewed as authentic authentically hip-hop um, by the hip-hop community, but you start to almost lose that um, when you go into these more kind of foreign territories, but I feel like that's where you really end up seeing the power of hip-hop as this um, as this kind of cultural platform to express your own kind of person and your own identity within the confines of hip-hop. Um, I think a paper like this ends up ex- like beautifully expressing that sort of idea, but, um, but I, I really enjoy that conversation anyhow. Well, I think you're like what you're describing are like real communities that people have made in different areas. And I think one of the problems I see is that sometimes those communities get set upon by commercial companies that want to sell that kind of style of hip hop as a genre. And they decide which three or four performers are going to be their headliners. And that gets, um, seen as that's the whole scene. Um, it, having someone commercialize your community <laughs> is uh, not usually a good thing. Um, I mean, I I get why someone would want to have a record deal because you know, you're talking about communities that are traditionally economically oppressed, it, so they they need the money. Um, but it, I think the, the commercial element can sometimes... Um, you know, they play up, this group doesn't like that group, and it's really for the dramatic effect that it's it can exacerbate problems or even create problems where I think they weren't before. Um, I think one of the things I like about all the different styles of hip-hop, all the different groups, is that it can function in a way that communicates political ideas and it reaches audiences that wouldn't normally be reading like a political manifesto or a political newspaper. Instead, sure. it communicates those political issues in a way that's really easy to grasp. And I think it was one of my first eye-opening opportunities as a young adult to learn how other people saw the world and to figure out how to see my own world in a more political way. Yeah, I'm reading a book right now by Jay Zone called um, Root for the Villain. It's an autobiography that Jay Zone ended up writing, I want to say, in 2011. Um, and one of the things that he ends up doing within the book, at least I'm only a part of, way, a part of the way through, but so far it seems to almost be lessons that hip hop has taught him. And he ends up going through different moments of his life and draws on a specific song or lyric that really ended up kind of teaching him a lesson or um, in, in many ways teaching him negatively different things on, on how to end up kind of behaving in the world um and then he sees himself learn from those experiences but it's always hip-hop is kind of at the center of it and from my own experience i too kind of see that a a lot of my vocabulary has been derived from hip-hop over the over the years a lot of my ideas on um on race and culture and politics have been shaped by by hip-hop um i I, i'm definitely a student of of hip-hop in more than just the I guess the traditional sense of of learning um, about hip hop, right? Um, I, I learn from a- a MCs and producers that that make these songs and sample these things, um, and I'm I'm constantly learning and, and researching and, and trying to figure out and trying to understand the song a little bit more in depth. And by doing so, it really ends up shaping who I am. Um, hip hop really is kind of this uh, this tool in order to yeah, to, to learn and, and to engage, I think, in, in cultural issues that you may not have otherwise done. Um, I think your example with Public Enemy is, is a great one. Um, and I feel like that resonates with a lot of people. Um, again, I've spoken to a lot of people over the course of the, the few years writing my own book on, on Canadian hip hop and um, speaking to a lot of these people that are growing up in the, the late 80s, early 90s. They're also learning about politics and cultural issues that they're not kind of aware of or that don't necessarily resonate with them or affect them um they're learning about this through rap lyrics and i think that's a really powerful tool absolutely i mean the number of times of 
snippet of lyric has occurred to me when I'm facing a big problem or even uh, walking through the grocery store sometimes. It's, uh, it's amazing how the ideas and the perspectives just kind of permeate your life. Yeah, 100%. It, the the lyric thing yeah i just um regardless of what i'm doing in my in my everyday life i'll end up saying a word or um i'll encounter a situation and there's almost always a lyric for that um I, yeah grocery store um looking for a black hole to casually collapse through try aisle nine by the cat food um there's just there's always something that is um that's relevant to the situation and so much of my um, how I approach situations have been been shaped by by hip hop. Um, it's yeah, it's it's really a fascinating tool in in that regard. Absolutely, and the fact that so many different types of people engage in hip hop music, and that when you can identify with someone doing a first person vocal who is very different from yourself, like the number of times. Eminem has helped me get through a huge workload in indigenous research. I can't even begin to describe. I I made like a, a happy <laughs> hip hop playlist before I went in to defend my PhD for the. It, it, uh, it it's a astounding ability to uh, transcend a lot of categories that might otherwise prevent people from understanding each other. I agree. One of the thoughts that ended up kept kind of popping into my head while reading this chapter is hip-hop kind of works in two different ways here. Not only is it able to give someone a platform to authentically express their own culture, whereas otherwise an avenue may not have existed, but it also allows for the same individuals to adopt a new culture, and that being hip-hop. Um, that aspect, I, I feel like, is not really touched too much in the book um, or in the chapter, but do you think that these cultures work in a similar way, that being indigenous culture and hip-hop culture? And... Do you see hip hop cultural continuity having the same effects on on mental health? I think it can absolutely have the same impacts on mental health in a positive way. So when I see people who are normally um, underrepresented in life in general being able to do music and to be listened to by the community, um, it offers a platform for self-expression that they might not have otherwise. Like you, if you, you can almost picture any group you might belong to. There's probably a hip hop version, uh, hip hop music that appeals to that group and that speaks yeah. to that experience. Uh, looking for indigenous hip hop, I found a bunch of Muslim hip hop and started listening to that. Uh, I looked for queer hip hop and found a bunch of that. There's, uh, it's really astounding, especially once you get out of the sort of the top 40 hip hop of uh, things that almost everybody listens to that you might find almost like a, an instrumental version of when you go into a store somewhere. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are never going to get radio play. And there's a huge, a huge opportunity there to find something that speaks to you on a really deep level and to not feel so alone. Like those moments where people can't picture a happy tomorrow, um, sometimes you just have to wait it out. And at least with hip hop, you're not waiting it out by yourself. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, it's again, hearkening back to that idea of the sense of belonging. And I think hip hop allows for, for a sense of belonging, not only in terms of the, the songs and just having someone uh, there that kind of relates to specific issues that you may end up going through. I think Eminem is a good example. I think Eminem ended up acting as a good coping mechanism for a lot of kids that were going through similar problems. Um, and they allowed, uh, he allowed them in order to kind of get through those issues on a day by day basis and end up seeing tomorrow because of it. Um, but um, even just being involved in the hip hop community, I feel like allows for that sense of community and that sense of culture and that sense of belonging. Um, so that you you feel like you have almost a purpose right it's it's delivering purpose into your life whereas maybe on a, on a song basis and just listening to the artist um maybe it's it's less of a sense of belonging but more of a sense of um kind of relating and, and somebody is going through these same issues with you um 
rather than where I'm a part of something and I have the, um, I guess, ability in order to contribute to this culture and make something, make something of it. And we're kind of all in this together in a sort of, in a sort of sense. In some ways I found it similar to uh, being a fan of comics. So, you know, if you're, you're having a life where a lot of people are mean to you, uh, you might attach yourself to particular heroes and see them as potentially coming to rescue you, even if only metaphorically. And I think sometimes the, the bombastic element in hip hop has been able to uh, help me express anger or to offer a potential, uh, even sort of imaginary protector that could solve some of my problems for me. Um, it's, it's a, it's an opportunity for people who feel stretched to the very edge of their resources to, to get a hand up by someone who seems to kind of have it together, or at least be slightly more together than I am at the moment. Um, so I think it's a, when I think about whose music do I listen to still, you know, it's, it's been it's been a long time. It's been many decades now, and it's still on my iPod. Uh, it's it's astounding to see the longevity that some of the music has. You know, I have to admit I stopped listening to the Beatles a while back, uh, but I still listen to Public Enemy. Uh, I I still listen to Ice Cube. <laughs> I still listen to Maestro Fresh West. <laughs> it's. Yeah. Uh, there's there's some stuff that just sticks with you that way. Yeah, and at least on my end, I I always I again I, I go through the same kind of thing, and I, I see a, the longevity of artists that I've kind of lived with over the years, um, and it's almost always boiled down to kind of the lyrical tip, right? A song may end up sounding good, and it may end up kind of staying in rotation for the, the few weeks that it's out, um, maybe even a year if it really kind of defined a moment of your life in that way, um, but the songs that are kind of very lyrically potent and that I feel like relate to a specific issue that I'm going through or that I think I can learn from, um, those are the ones that end up staying with me the longest. Um, I also, I'm 20, uh, 27 years old, and uh, I also ended up growing up with, with Eminem, and he was a large factor, um, and he acted as a coping mechanism for me in a lot of ways, and I still end up going back, and even though I disagree with a lot of what Eminem has, has done personally, and uh, I guess even what he stands for in a lot of different ways, I, I do end up valuing a lot of those kind of... Um, therapy sessions that Eminem ended up giving me at one period of time, and I still end up using them as a sort of therapy in my life today. Um, but even as I've evolved, artists like Aesop Rock, for example, um, or Dead Prez, or a lot of these artists that really hit me kind of emotionally, lyrically, um, they they still stay with me. Um, today like I, I can listen to those albums and i can still get something out of them um and i i don't really find that with other genres um i i can listen to another i can listen to a radiohead album or something of that nature to get into a mood or to relax um but i i engage with it in an entirely different way i agree i i'm 47 this year and there's been some songs that I've been listening to for 20 years and you get you get new things out of the same song it means something different there's times where I can recognize and appreciate things in the music that I didn't see the first decade or so I listened to it yeah. now, sometimes there are things where I go through a period and I listen to someone repeatedly for hours on end and then maybe I don't need it as much later on um, I know when I was getting through my PhD, I was listening to Paris a lot, and it was really helping me to kind of deal with some of the frustrations around the bureaucracy of academia. Yeah. Um, I don't. <laughs> maybe I should start listening to it again, but uh, it's there's a certain uh, drive that I see in hip hop that it, it just sounds like it's going somewhere, and so you kind of want to be on that journey. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I'm going to end up wrapping up this conversation here. But again, I, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time out to speak to me here today. I appreciate it. Um, I'd love to have you back on in the future whenever I end up reading more of your publications. Um, it's definitely something that I, I would like to do at least at some point in the future. Um, before I end up getting you to go, though, I just wanted to ask what are some of your or where are some of your current research lies um, and what you're currently working on? Sure. Uh, so I grew up in poverty. Um, I, we, we didn't get running water in my house till I was about 14. Uh, and so I'm uh, currently doing some research work looking at the experiences of LGBTQ and two-spirit people in relation to poverty and also looking at how Indigenous people might view and define poverty in different ways than just socioeconomically. So uh, it's a uh, research I'm really passionate about, and I I feel for me like it does connect up with the my interest in rap music because uh, this is you know hip hop emerges from some of the poorest communities in America and uh, it it deals with economic issues constantly and so as a as a poor person uh, you know pop was not talking about poverty. Pop was not talking about being hungry or, or about uh, intergenerational violence or about alcoholism. Uh, hip-hop was doing that. And so for me, uh, hip-hop has always been the music that told what was really going on. And that kind of, like, how can you resist it when someone's going to tell you the truth in a way that's enjoyable to listen to? Yeah, no doubt. I, um, yeah, I never really thought about that in that way, but yeah, hip hop is um, telling the truth in a way that's enjoyable to listen to. Um, I, I agree with that. Thanks for having me on your show, Alex. <laughs>